world news tonight. Indicted again. A second court indictment quashes jailed Prime Minister Imran Khan's election ambitions. Widening wars. Australia considers sending warship to Middle East amidst escalating Israel-Hamas conflict. Landmark summit. The COP28 draws to a close signalling the end of fossil fuel era. Panda plays. Adorable panda frolics in fluffy snow at Beijing Zoo after first winter snowfall. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News. Tonight we begin in Pakistan as jailed former Prime Minister Imran Khan pleaded not guilty to charges of leaking state secrets under an indictment that dealt a new blow to his chances of contesting in Pakistan's general election in February. The charges are related to a classified cable called Cypher sent to Islamabad by Pakistan's ambassador in Washington last year that Khan is accused of making public. Khan's lawyer Gohar Khan contested the indictment, saying that it would be valid only if signed by the accused. The former Prime Minister has previously said the contents of the cable appeared in the media from other sources. Khan says the cable was proof of a conspiracy by the Pakistani military and U.S. government to topple his government in 2022 after he visited Moscow just before Russia's invasion of Rukhye. Washington and Pakistan's military denied the accusations. Lawyers said that a guilty verdict under the Official Secrets Act could bring up to 10 years in prison. It is the second time Khan has been indicted on the same charges after a superior court struck down an earlier indictment on technical grounds, saying the correct procedure had not been followed. In a step towards improving relations, Azerbaijan and Armenia said they exchanged prisoners at their border. The exchange involved the release by Azerbaijan of 32 Armenians mostly captured in late 2020. In return, Armenia handed over two Azerbaijani soldiers held since April 2023. Azerbaijan and Armenia traded prisoners of war at their border on Wednesday. It signals a step towards the normalisation of a decades-old conflict between the two countries. Azerbaijan set 32 Armenians free, while Armenia handed back two soldiers they've held since April. The countries were discussing withdrawing troops from their shared border, though no decision had been taken. The South Caucasus neighbours have fought two wars in the past 30 years over Nagorno-Karabakh, a mountainous area that is part of Azerbaijan, but where ethnic Armenians had established de facto independence in the 1990s. Azerbaijan recaptured Karabakh in a lightning offensive in September, prompting most of its 120,000 ethnic Armenians to flee to Armenia. Upon announcing the prisoner release last week, the two sides said they reconfirmed their intention to normalise relations and reach a peace treaty. It's welcome news for the United States and European Union. Both have tried to persuade Azerbaijan and Armenia to settle outstanding issues, including the demarcation of their borders. Armenia and Azerbaijan were both part of the Soviet Union, which collapsed in 1991. Russia regards itself as the security guarantor in the region, but its influence has declined in recent years due to the war in Ukraine. On to the war in Ukraine. Dozens of people have been injured in a wave of missile strikes on the Ukrainian capital Kyiv overnight. At least 53 people were hurt in the attacks, including six children. Firefighters scrambled to beat back raging infernos as they ravaged several buildings in the Nipovitsky district of Kyiv. The damage could have been much worse had Kyiv's forces not intercepted 10 Russian ballistic missiles, causing loud explosions, while debris fell on parts of the capital. Like many homes here, Petro's flats felt the full force of the blasts. We were just sleeping. It is fortunate that we were covered with a blanket. If not for the blanket, we would have been covered with glass. The whole apartment is covered in glass. Over 50 people were left injured in the attack, including six children. Falling rocket debris also damaged the district's water supply system. 
It brings back dark memories of last winter, when Russia's heavy bombardment on Ukraine's energy infrastructure left parts of the country without heat, light or running water. 21 months into the conflict, and Ukrainians still can't wrap their heads around why Russia is doing this. Let that Putin, let Dmitry Medvedev, that government in Russia, hear me. What are they doing? What's wrong with their brains? What's wrong with their heads? Today, in the 21st century, they can make such a mess and throw rockets at Ukrainians. This attack is the latest reminder that Russia is still committed to this war. According to the British Defence Ministry, Moscow has been stockpiling air-launched cruise missiles from its heavy bomber fleet. This while Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky continues to call on Western allies to send more supplies for Kyiv's dwindling air defence systems and ammunitions. Fueling the fears of a wider conflict, the United States has asked Australia to send a warship to the Red Sea amid ongoing attacks on commercial shipping from Iran-backed militia. The request made recently came from the U.S. Navy, which wants the vessel to join an international task force, of which Australia is one of 39 member nations. In the top end today, fresh from a visit to Perth, <laughs> the acting Prime Minister welcoming our Australian defence personnel home. News more will soon be leaving our shores. On land, more soldiers will train Ukrainian forces in the UK for a longer time frame. Whilst on sea, an old ally has called for help in the Middle East. We do continue to consult closely with our international allies and partners on implementing a maritime task force. We'll consider this request in due course, but I would note that the focus of our naval efforts right now are on our immediate region. A spade of recent attacks from Iranian-backed Houthi rebels hampering shipping lanes. The Middle East is really important to Australia's security. We've always been a great contributor to regional and global peace, and the government should consider this closely. In Washington... This vote, the yeas are 87, the nays are 13, and the conference report is agreed to. The US Senate finally passing a trillion-dollar defence package that includes provisions for the AUKUS nuclear submarine pact. The AUKUS agreement is a game changer. It will create a new fleet of nuclear-powered submarines to counter the Chinese Communist Party's threat and influence in the Pacific. We're very excited by that news. A nuclear fleet, a significant step closer, but still years away. Latest U.S. election updates on the road to the White House now. New Hampshire Governor Chris Sununu endorsed Nikki Haley for president, giving the former South Carolina governor a boost in a key early state. It's a big boost for Nikki Haley's presidential campaign. You can feel the energy! The former South Carolina governor picking up the endorsement of popular New Hampshire Governor Chris Sununu six weeks before his state's first in the nation primary. So are you going to finally endorse Nikki Haley for president? You bet your ass I am! Let's get this thing done! Sununu backing Haley comes a month after Iowa Governor Kim Reynolds endorsed Ron DeSantis for president. DeSantis, Haley and other Republican primary candidates all trail former President Trump by more than 30 points in the polls. Thank you. Thanks. At a town hall last night, DeSantis doubted that Sununu's endorsement will boost Haley's standing among conservatives. Even a campaigner as good as Chris is not going to be able to paper over uh, Nikki being an establishment candidate. DeSantis also took aim at Trump, accusing him of flip-flopping on abortion, overreaching in his response to COVID-19, and failing to build a border wall. The Florida governor also discussing health care, vowing to replace Obamacare. He was pressed on how he would do it. Meanwhile, West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin is declining to say whether he'll make a third party run for president as he downplays recent polls. Welcome back. People in Argentina are braced for turmoil as the new government's economic shock therapy program kicks in. The country's skyrocketing inflation lays bare the daunting challenges new President Javier Mille faces in navigating the country's turbulent economic waters. 
Argentine builder Eduardo Casado is feeling the pinch. He's been stunned by how fast life is getting more expensive. I bought two kilos of potatoes last week at 800 pesos, and this week it's almost 1,200. I don't know if next week we'll be able to buy the same goods. Casado's pain is felt nationwide. Figures out this week showed inflation hitting 161%, and most economists think there is worse to come. The new government of libertarian president Javier Millet has just unveiled a package of shock therapy for the economy. Among other measures, it devalued Argentina's peso currency by over 50% versus the dollar. The government says that will help exporters. But it will also make imports more expensive, guaranteeing another jump in inflation. Economist Hernán Lecher says investors will be watching to see if Argentines can stomach the medicine. La duda del mercado es, la sociedad resiste esto. The market's question is, can society endure this? That is their doubt. They'll see if day after day society gets angry, if they react, if they can't handle it anymore, if they get angry at the government, or if they are happy with the cuts. O si está contenta con el recorte. The government also plans to slash energy subsidies and drastically reduce the public sector workforce. In return, it has promised to beef up some social spending, including child allowances. Presidential spokesman Manuel Adorni admits it's going to hurt, but says there is no option. This government did not receive a patient with a toothache. We found a patient in intensive care that is about to die. We are not willing to let this patient die because if it dies, it means poverty will have no limits. Argentines voted for Millet knowing he planned drastic action. Many agree it's necessary, but also wonder how they will make ends meet. The big question is when or whether it will all pay off. At work in Buenos Aires, Casado says the rich and powerful won't suffer. He says it's ordinary folk who may feel swept away. A UN analysis has found that the number of hungry people in Central and West Africa will increase to a record 49.5 million around mid-2024. Let's take a look. A record number of people are expected to go hungry in Western Central Africa next year, the United Nations has warned. 49.5 million, a rise of 4% due to a combination of high food prices, climate change and conflict. Millions have been displaced by insurgent violence in the Sahel region, in addition to multiple ongoing conflicts in Democratic Republic of Congo. Olo Sib, a senior research advisor at the UN's World Food Programme, said 80% of those currently affected by food insecurity live in conflict zones. We also witness the impacts of climate change. For instance, this year there have been prolonged periods of halted rainfall in certain areas, resulting in significant crop losses for local farmers. A WFP regional security analysis said more than two out of three households in West and Central Africa cannot afford healthy diets. It said the cost of a daily nutritious diet in countries like Burkina Faso, Mali and Niger is 110% higher than the daily minimum wage. Economic challenges such as soaring prices, inflation and currency devaluation in some countries have made it exceedingly tough for many households to regularly access food. Sib warned that, without intervention, the situation could deteriorate further in certain areas, as over 2.6 million people were at risk of falling into famine. After intense negotiations, the COP28 climate summit in Dubai came to a close. It produced the first ever climate deal with language on fossil fuels, but called for a transition away rather than phase out of oil, coal and gas. A historic climate deal. Nations at the COP28 climate summit in Dubai agreed on transitioning away from fossil fuels. 
It is a first for a UN climate conference to produce such a deal, though it still stops short of including a long demand call for a phase out of oil, coal, and gas. We have language on fossil fuel in our final agreement for the first time ever. The final consensus came after COP28 was extended beyond its official closing time of midday Tuesday due to intense overnight negotiations over the key sticking point, whether the tax should include a call to phase down or phase out fossil fuels. Along with the final tax transitioning away, nations also agreed on commitments to triple the capacity of renewables and double energy efficiency by 2030. Other progress was made in adaptation and finance, including the operationalization of the loss and damage fund to support countries most vulnerable to climate change. The UN and EU largely celebrated the deal as a milestone achievement in global climate action. I think this is a global turning point. For the first time, the world is committing to transition away from fossil fuels. So this has the potential to be the beginning of a new era the post-fossil era. They are a climate action lifeline, not a finish line. Now all governments and businesses need to turn these pledges into real economy outcomes without delay. The decision also satisfied oil producers like Saudi Arabia who've been advocating reducing carbon emissions rather than fossil fuel phase out. But it left island countries that are facing the direct impact of climate change dissatisfied, as well as developing countries that raise issues of equal responsibility. Tesla is recalling more than 2 million cars after the U.S. regulator found its driver assistance system, Autopilot, was partly defective. It follows a two-year investigation into crashes which occurred when the tech was in use. Tesla is recalling just over 2 million vehicles in the United States. It's to install new safeguards for vehicles carrying its autopilot advanced driver assistance system. The electric vehicle giant made the move after a safety regulator said the system was open to foreseeable misuse. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, or NHTSA, has investigated Tesla for more than two years. He wanted to know whether its vehicles adequately ensure drivers pay attention when using the driver assistance system. Tesla said in the recall filing that Autopilot's software system controls may not be sufficient to prevent driver misuse and could increase the risk of a crash. Tesla's Autopilot is intended to enable cars to steer, accelerate and brake automatically within their lane. Enhanced Autopilot can assist in changing lanes and highways but does not make them autonomous. Tesla said it did not agree with the regulator's analysis, but added it would deploy an over-the-air software update. It said this will incorporate additional controls and alerts to those already existing on affected vehicles. The aim is to encourage the driver to stick to their continuous driving responsibility whenever auto steer is engaged. The company did not respond to a question on whether the recall would be performed outside the US. NHTSA opened a probe in 2021 into Autopilot after identifying more than a dozen crashes in which Tesla vehicles hit stationary emergency vehicles. Its investigation into Autopilot will remain open as it monitors Tesla's remedies. Welcome back. Britain, Japan and Italy have signed a treaty to build supersonic stealth fighter jets. For more on that story and more, it's Save Around the World. Britain, Japan and Italy signed an international treaty today to establish a program aimed at developing an advanced supersonic stealth fighter jet. Heavy rains wreak havoc in northeast Australia today, downing trees, cutting power and forcing evacuations and road closures as residents face a risk of life-threatening flash floods. Germany's government clinched a last-minute deal on its 2024 budget that will see Berlin return to its self-imposed limits on new debt, despite warnings that this could hamper growth in Europe's top economy and its green transition. 
British coin producer, the Royal Mint, in partnership with the United Kingdom's Natural History Museum, unveiled a new series of collectible 50 pen coins, each showcasing a different iconic dinosaur. Costa Rica's President Rodrigo Chavez backed Guatemalan President-elect Bernardo Arvalo following comments from Guatemala's Attorney General seeking to block Arvalo's move into power. That is all we have for you on World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we bring you updates from across the globe. If you miss any of today's programs, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. Tonight, we are leaving you in China as an adorable panda rolled around playfully in Beijing Zoo after the first snowfall of winter arrived in the Chinese capital, blanketing the city in snow. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.